Okay, great. All right, everybody. So I think we're uh, on air now. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, I wanted to uh, thank everybody for uh, for joining, and um, so we're here to talk about um, the exciting new paper that just came out, um, which uh, some have called uh, ushering in a dawn of uh, an age of virtual cell biology. Um, I think it's very exciting, and um, so my name is Stephen Larson. I'm uh, you know personally interested in this, um, having you know, background in computational science as well as biological science. Um, the folks that are in the audience here are, you know, collected from interested people on the internet, also participants in a project that I helped coordinate called the Open Worm Project. Um, we also have with us one of the authors of the paper, the first author of the paper, uh, Jonathan Carr, uh, whom uh, we'll be asking uh, questions of here. And um, for those of you who are watching live, uh, feel free to post your questions in the comments uh, for the stream of this uh, of this chat of the um, of the hangout, and we'll uh, do our best to you know ask your questions in the course of this session. Um, we have blocked out about two hours for this session. Not sure if we'll use it all, but um, you know if we do uh, and the conversation gets interesting, um, I think that uh, you know we could definitely take that time. Um, so what I'm what I, I have prepared a short presentation. That walks it through some of the you know, uh, that walks through the paper. I try to kind of cover it at a high level. Um, so there's some pieces of it that I won't go into in as great detail with. But my goal is to try and um, bridge for those of you who may not be as familiar with um, some of the practices of computational biology, either on the computational side or on the biology side, and you know, what's going on inside um, inside this paper. And uh, you know, I'll rely on Jonathan to uh, rein me in or uh, Correct me or add anything if I uh, overstep uh, the description of the of the paper. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, and um, and uh, let's get started. Okay. Okay. Does everybody see that? I think so. All right. So um, this uh, title, Dawn of Virtual Cell Biology, is not my title. Uh, this is the, the title that was given to the uh, news feature in the journal Cell. Um, so this work here was published uh, exactly one week ago in the journal Cell. Uh, the title of the paper is A Whole Cell Computational Model Predicts Phenotype from Genotype. Um, I encourage you to read the original paper, and what I'm hoping in this presentation to do is to uh, be able to give you an overview of, uh, of that. So um, just a couple comments to start off with. This is a lot of words, but just to kind of give you a sense of where things are right now, um, and I hope I'm not overstepping my editorialization, but um, I think right now computer science and biological science are in the middle of a, of a grand crossover. Uh, this certainly is uh, computational biology as a field has been around for quite a while, um, but um, I would say that um, although it's not new, it's still not yet a primary tool in every biological researcher's toolbox for the understanding of living systems. It's something where a lot of um, interesting methods have come out and a lot of important uh, findings have, um, have been published in the field of, of computational biology with regards to having algorithms that fit biological processes, but, um, but the field of biology as a whole um, is very broad and there's still plenty of work that happens um, without really a computational model behind it, um, which is fine, but um, I think that the, that the theme of this paper is really uh, pushing the convergence of those two areas together. Um, and one of the things that's interesting when you compare computational science is um, that, uh, you know, the physical sciences have had simulation research, uh, simulation driven research for quite a while, um, for I think a lot longer, um, you know, things like uh, simulating atomic bomb blasts or simulating physical mechanics are all things that, um, you know, we've seen um, in the areas of, um, in, in the areas of the physical sciences, but, um, and, and they're used a lot more often, I'd say, uh, in, in primary research to have a real comparison to what's going on. For biological systems, though, Sometimes um, computer simulations can be the subject of some debate um, about their validity because of the, 
uh, because of the fact that uh, biological systems have a lot more moving parts. Uh, they're a lot more complex. And sometimes there's some tension between a simple description of a biological system, which can lead to understanding, versus a more comprehensive um, computational model that uh, some perceive as, as you know, difficult to analyze and interpret. Um, in my view, uh, papers like this one uh, that just came out that we're talking about here are, uh, are really a, a tour de force demonstration to the community of, of what's possible. And in my view, really do raise the standard for the computational community um, for kind of what level of description is necessary uh, to make predictions that are relevant to biologists and which biologists will, um, you know, will find useful. So, um, so that's kind of just some of, some of the beginning of, of what this is about. As a broad overview of this paper, um, I tried to kind of break it down into is basically three things that this paper is talking about. So it's built uh, a computational model of a cell, a comprehensive model of a, of a single living cell. Um, that means that the algorithms were built, a database was compiled, tests were written, and there was a web front end uh, that was constructed. Um, this model was then used to make predictions of various things about what that cell would do. Growth rates, um, phenotypes that would emerge from disrupting genes, which means um, basically how the cell would uh, behave given uh, the removal of a gene. gene. Um, rates of protein at DNA association, which is to say um, you know, how protein in the cell was, um, was present or absent, um, depending on how DNA was um, being processed, and as well as distribution of energy. And those are the, some of the predictions that have come out of this model that were highlighted in the paper. And then, there, as importantly, there was a validation step against actual experimental data um, of those growth rates of gene disruption phenotypes that had been published in, in previous journals and um, rates of protein DNA association. Okay, so um, as a guide to kind of understanding the paper uh, at a high level, I found it useful to realize that uh, the paper was more than just uh, the article itself. Um, it's also, um, there's also several supplemental materials for you to understand what's going on here. Um, so um, there is a large supplemental um, addendum to the paper. It's 122 pages and in there. There's a lot more detail um, that's necessary to understand what's going on with the paper. Full descriptions of algorithms, um, full descriptions uh, of the uh, data that we need for reconstruction. And, um, and so that's important as well. Um, also, there's an entire knowledge base which is represented in the paper, um, in, in the publication as a, as a spreadsheet. And I'll show that um, a little bit later. Um, uh, it, it, looking at this spreadsheet gives you a real clear handle on all of the different data that were compiled um, from over 900 references in order to put this paper together. Um, I heard 900 references and I was like, really? Are there 900 references? And uh, you look at the spreadsheet and um, it's actually like, I don't know, 25 subsheets and uh, all sorts of rows and information in there. Uh, so yes, in fact, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it really is a very well-referenced uh, piece of piece of work there. And then as well, there's the source code, um, which was also made uh, completely public uh, at the time of publication, um, uh, which I think is, uh, is also just a really great standard for the field um, to have all that source code. It was written in MATLAB. Um, and all that's available at uh, simtk.org, which is an uh, organization put up by Stanford. Obviously, this work was done primarily at Stanford University um, in collaboration with uh, the Venture Institute. So all, that, all that's available, and I highly encourage you to get all of those pieces because um, the article is just the sort of scratching the surface of um, all the work that was done um, in this paper. Okay, so I wanted to just give a brief intro to the cell itself. Um, that's Mycoplasm, Mycoplasma genitalium. Um, this is a, an organism of um, increased interest um, in recent years. Um, for, its, uh, for several properties. So one of the reasons that it's uh, exciting is that it has a very small genome. Um, it's uh, 500,000 base pairs, which if you want to compare that with other organisms is 0.5 megabases, um, which if you compare it to C. elegans, um, another highly studied organism, it has 97 megabases versus 3,000 megabases in humans. So you can see proportionally um, there's a lot fewer genes, a lot fewer base pairs in, in, in its DNA. Um, and so for this, for this reason, it's uh, attractive 
uh, starting point for computational models. Um, it's also uh, one micron in size, so it's it that so that's pretty small. Um, and I actually wanted to um, really quickly uh, show you, kind of put that uh, size in context. Um, actually, there's this really nice uh, scale app that I wanted to show here. So I'm just going to switch over, switch over to this um, because sometimes I think um, you know the size of a micrometer um, for those of us who aren't uh, trained. In, in these different sizes can sometimes be a little uh, confusing. So this is a nice little app. Um, this is a nice app uh, that uh, is on the web for um, for describing different scaling. And um, if you um, if you kind of zoom in here, so it sort of starts at the level of uh, you know uh, a human, a beach ball, a dodo bird, and uh, so you kind of have to zoom in for quite a while before you're going to get anywhere towards a micrometer. There's a shrew, there's an earthworm, right? Now we're down to the level of a coffee bean, okay? And we're going past an ant. Um, I'm going to zoom in to the uh, size of the largest bacterium, okay? Going past um, paper, smallest thing visible than, to the human eye. There goes a human egg, okay? And now we start to actually get to some cells, okay? So this is where I think, for me, it was sort of interesting to... Um, see this, um, uh, you know, see the comparison here. So that's a, that's a human skin cell that we're leaving behind. Here's a white blood cell that we're leaving behind, okay. A whole X chromosome in a human, okay, is actually um, about the same size as an E. coli bacterium, which uh, is still larger than a mycoplasm genitalium, okay. And so it's not here until we get down to this level where we actually have a micrometer. And, um, and so here we're at about, so you can see that a micrometer is, is a fraction of what an E. coli is, uh, slightly larger than the largest virus, okay, about the level of the uh, uh, wavelength of violet light and, um, and uh, maybe on the order of a, of a virus sort of bacteriophage, um, which, uh, you know, is a common, uh, a common thing that would attack our, our cells. So um, this is what we're talking about. It's about at this order that we're talking about the size of this thing. Um, so just to kind of give you an orientation, it's, it's much, much smaller than, you know, even a, a normal chromosome in a, in a human cell, much, much smaller than a skin cell. We're talking about something that's pretty tiny. Okay. Um, switching back. All right. Um, also, uh, an interesting, interesting thing about this uh, organism, it doesn't have a cell wall. So um, a lot of antibiotics uh, that are used to attack bacteria will, will um, attack the mechanism that produces the cell wall to break it down. Um, Mycoplasma genitalium is immune to that because it doesn't have one. Um, it's also the second complete bacterium genome that was ever sequenced. And, um, and one of its claims to fame recently is that its DNA was replaced with synthesized DNA, meaning uh, a DNA molecule that was uh, built by a machine, um, and, uh, and, that, uh, and um, when that DNA was placed back inside of a, a, um, a shell, um, it was able to su successfully replicate, and uh, that was done in 2008 by Craig Venter, and, and I think that was a fairly significant um, finding in, in the area, sort of kicking off um, this area of synthetic biology. Okay. So that's the organism that we're talking about. This is the organism that was used uh, as, the, um, as the building block for this model and, and, and simulation. So it's, it's got several uh, different pieces inside it. And, um, and so um, what are all the things inside the cell that it's tracking? So it's basically tracking six, 16 state variables that define all of what the cell is doing. And this is the, the basic list of those variables. So metabolite RNA and protein copy numbers. So, so counts of um, basically different kinds of molecules that are inside of the cell. Um, the fluxes of metabolic reactions, so how those cells are interacting with each other, um, the rates at which they interact with each other. Um, the uh, nascent DNA, RNA, and protein polymers, so how they're being combined together into um, different larger molecules, polymers. Um, the molecular machines, which are causing activity to happen, uh, cell mass, volume, and shape are being tracked. Um, 
different uh, variables in the external environment, and I block these out. So temperature, uh, different kinds of radiation are uh, variables that are being tracked, radiation that might affect some of the molecular processes, um, three different uh, Boolean stress conditions, and then time. And so the time scale of the model is a second, um, and it approximates um, all of the activities um, above as a well-mixed system. Um, so I wanted to kind of put those uh, things into perspective, um, and so let me see if this is actually if this is actually going to play. I just want to make sure that the YouTube video is coming across. Let's see here, is it, it going to be viewed in the Hangouts? So while this is loading up, um, I wanted to just um, there there's some visualizations about this for those of you who. Um, for those of you for whom some of this cell biology may not be uh, intuitive, I wanted to um, be able to show um, a little bit of a visualization of what of what these are. Okay, so I have a feeling this is going to be a bit blocky for those of you that are in um, that are watching through the Hangout. But um, so maybe I'll just kind of describe um, what this is, and as the still pictures load up, so. Um, an animator named Drew Barry is, um, is, is well known for his ability to um, visualize some of the processes that are happening inside cells. And he recently gave a TED Talk. I recommend that you uh, check it out. It's called um, Animations of, Un of Unseeable Biology. Yeah, so this doesn't seem like it's, uh, it's actually rendering very quickly. Um, actually, yeah. If, um, Maybe what I should do is try this in the in the YouTube uh, widget here for the Hangout. But um, but basically, um, you should check it out because it goes through several of the processes that this uh, this model is simulating. Um, one of the ones here at around three minutes and thirty seconds um, is the process of DNA replication. And what you see in the movie is um, and the actual uh, mechanism uh, that. Uh, that is used as, as, as much as can be described in, a, in, a, um, in an animation um, of, the, of the process that uh, cells use to replicate their DNA. And um, in, in the video, um, which unfortunately isn't coming up, uh, in, in the video you basically see um, the different pieces and parts of this molecular machine taking turns at making, um, at, at handling the DNA, splitting open the DNA, um, causing replication to occur. Yeah, so there's a, there's a still image. So these, um, these different colored, the green and the blue pieces are the molecules that are handling um, the strand of DNA um, that's being uh, filtered through um, as if it's sort of uh, a, a stream of uh, a molecule that's passing through. And it's, uh, it's actually doing the, the, the work in a very mechanical way of doing uh, DNA replication. Um, so in the model, um, this is something, this is one of the 28 cell processes that are simulated. Um, a little bit farther in to, the, to this animation, um, he presents, uh, he zooms out from the DNA uh, replication process and shows the process of the chromosomes lining up in, inside of a cell, which isn't mycoplasm, um, and, uh, and you see the cell splitting. So for those of you who have watched... Um, you know, in cell biology, a cell taking, um, a cell doing a division, um, you've seen this process where basically all the chromosomes will light up, line up at the midline, and they'll separate into two different um, uh, pockets, and then eventually the whole cell will divide into, um, into two pieces. So this first uh, picture in, um, which is the first figure of the paper, kind of highlights in a, in a large picture all of these different processes. And uh, the ones in the video, um, if you get a chance to check it out, again, starting at 3 minutes, 30 seconds, um, and going for about uh, a minute or two, you'll actually see three of the, of the 28 processes that are outlined here, which are the chromosome segregation, that's the chromosomes take, uh, moving to either side. You'll see the DNA replication happening inside the cell, and you'll see cytokinesis happening um, of the splitting of the cell. And, and, of course, that's not the same type of cell that we're talking about here, but many of the same cell processes are conserved. And that's you know, one of the reasons why I think the simulation is, is, is an important piece, because it does have many of the, essentially, a comprehensive look at the processes that a cell has to undergo um, during its life cycle, right? From, um, sort of from an initial state um, to a splitting of that cell into daughter cells um, and a restarting of the cell life cycle. Um, 
So these, so this is kind of an overview of those different processes. Steven? Yeah, it looks like we uh looks like we've we lost, lost Steven. Him. We lost his audio. I don't know if we lost him. Is back. Whoops! <laughs> what happened? <laughs> Someone tripped on the router. <laughs> I'm gonna have to talk to somebody at Google about this. All right, uh, can somebody tell me where uh, where you lost me? <laughs> have you been talking this at whole time? The end of the picture, <laughs> I guess. Which which picture? Oh. The cell in the paper. Okay, the cell in the paper. Here. All right. Yeah. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for pinging me. If that happens again, just uh, just hit me on the uh, on the chat, okay? <laughs> All right. Thanks everybody for the patience. Uh, the broadcast stopped, Steven. So I get, oh, it's on air again. Yeah, it's back on there yeah. now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We're we're going without an ad. Um, we're getting through it though. Let me see if uh, closing anything helps on my side. All right. So um, let's uh, let's 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 go again. All right. So uh, I was so I was basically saying yeah. So um, if you, if you if you watch the movie, you can see the three processes for which arrows are pointing to here: DNA replication, chromosome segregation, cytokinesis. In the second uh, figure um, that's contained here, you can see a, a diagrammatic description of the cell variables on the left and the algorithms on the right. Um, so. Um, um, so those, for those of you who have programming background, you, in, a, in, a, in a simplistic way, these are variables that you would declare that uh, create a space in memory. And on the right, these are algorithms that, um, that take those variables and do something with them. And uh, again, those three processes in this case are represented uh, here, where you've got um, the, the, um, the chromosomes bundling up, um, you've got DNA replicating, and you've got uh, cells dividing uh, down here. And, and um, in the middle, you've got lines that are connecting um, which uh, algorithms are using what uh, variables and how they're being updated in time. And so the basic flow is that the cell model is initialized. Uh, these variables all get um, values. Those variables are then read in by these algorithms. And until the cell is divided, the process continues and time is updated and the cell variables uh, continue. If the cell has divided, that's considered the end of the end of the simulation. Okay. Um, so, a big piece of uh, what went into building this model was um, a significant amount of reconstruction, and this, for me, I think was um, you know one of the exciting strong points of of this paper, um, which was 
the degree to which degree to which it was built on top of a lot of work that had happened. And it really kind of shows you as well how much needed to happen already in, in, in bioinformatics uh, to pave the way for a simulation like this to be reasonable. Um, and it also, I think, really grounds the paper in um, you know, a lot of previous work. Um, I was mentioning earlier the degree to which um, this is contained inside of the documentation here. I just want to I just want to give you a sense here um, as I as I switch actually over. I want to I want to walk through this uh, this this spreadsheet or just just real briefly just to click around to give you all a sense of it if you haven't. Oh man. Okay, maybe I'm not gonna maybe I'm not gonna share my screen anymore. Uh, that's kind of uh, that's kind of so maybe I won't do that because uh, it happened when I did the the, the screen share thing. But um, uh, basically, I, I encourage you to uh, to click around through that. Um, as I look through it myself, it starts from S3A, a taxonomy, um, and it goes all the way to S3BN. Um, inside this um, are multiple sheets. Uh, many many of them have uh, notes that annotate uh, the contents inside them. And so essentially, um, the uh, different databases that um, are represented in that slide that I was just showing you have been pulled into this spreadsheet. And, and the spreadsheet is really just a, a, a um, while it's running. Um, but the enormity of the, the different data that are pulled into this are really, um, really quite significant, and I think um, you know is, is one of the reasons why um, this paper is so strong. Okay, I'm going to cross my fingers and, and pull the um, pull the presentation back up. Make sure that I'm still here. Yes. Okay. Good. All right. So just just as a walkthrough. So um, so uh, primary sources include sources on DNA repair, um, how DNA uh, and, and how it gets damaged. So that being a crucial process that cells need to, need to deal with, those are represented inside the model. Um, how RNA modifies itself, the structure of metabolites, the structure um, of, um, you know, of the DNA pieces that are being used, um, the, the composition of uh, the chemicals that are used inside the cell, the, um, the kinetics of reactions, um, the half-lives of mRNA, um, antibiotics. So there's a, there's a ton of things in here where, um, you know, um, if there's a critique of the model, um, it, it, it may be, you know, referring back to a critique of, you know, some of this data. It's essentially, you know, built itself on top of a lot of things that have come before it. Um, and I think it's very powerful to synthesize this information and then see um, where things, um, you know, uh, might be in conflict with each other. And in fact, the paper does outline some places in which, in order to fit this all together into a single model, there were some uh, pieces that, um, you know, might not have fit and uh, which needed to be reconciled in order to, to pull this together. I mean, it should also be pointed out that these sources come from uh, sometimes, in some cases, some different organisms that were needed. You know, some, some of these data come from E. coli. I think I actually um, specify this a little bit later. Um, but, um, but all of it needed to be, um, you know, fit together in order to provide what was a comprehensive uh, description of the model. The authors make a point of uh, pointing out that they were really working to, to build something that was comprehensive and not just focusing in on a few different um, uh, processes, cell processes. Um, so they were um, trying to make sure that they were comprehensive as one, as one of their goals. And as a result, um, several of the algorithms that, they, that are in the paper were actually algorithms that they developed um, to try and do, do the best they could to, to deal with the data that were there and to do their best job of representing these cellular processes. So I think that um, in the future, this paper is likely to be cited um, for a lot of the algorithms that it chose to use as good compromises between um, you know, maybe a, a very detailed anatomical molecular layer description and uh, a very high level coarse description of, of some of these processes. Um, so again, I was, I was kind of walking through some of these training data. Um, so some of the things that the paper outlined, just in a bit more in a bit more detail. So um, they they did pull uh, you know mRNA expression from um, from a different organism, some uh, measured RNA composition from E. coli, um, some cellular composition from 
um, M. galaseptisum, um, and, and growth rates from wild type M. genitalis. Okay, so on to some, some of the predictions uh, that the model made. This is one of the, the figures from the paper. Making sure I'm still here. Okay, good. Um, so, um, so obviously the cell cycle is um, an important um, way to, uh, un to, to, is an important feature of, of, what, of any cell's behavior, um, meaning um, to how long is it spending in, um, in the process of dividing, how long is it spending in the process of replicating its DNA, how long does it take for the replication of the DNA process to begin. So um, in the course of uh, bundling all this information together, having all these uh, different uh, processes happening at the same time, um, they're able to look at what, what, how much time uh, their simulated cells are spending in these different phases. So um, what percent of the cells are spending time in cytokinesis over, over the duration of, their, of the run? Uh, what percent are spending time in replication, initiation? What are spending time in replication? And, and what are uh, being spent in um, other parts of the cell cycle? Um, and that's broken down here in, in this B part of the figure where um, amidst those different cycles, they're also able to look at the concentrations of different, of specific molecules that are represented inside of their model. So in this case, the auric complex is involved in, uh, cell, uh, in, in DNA replication. So they're able to see that um, during a DNA replication in their model, uh, the amount of that particular molecule increases and then drops during the process of, of replication um, and sort of bounces around a bit. Whereas uh, the copy number of chromosomes sort of stays flat before replication initiation, but then increases during the process of replication, which you might expect if replication is happening, there's going to be larger copy numbers of, of different chrom chromosomes. And then it stays flat during the, the cytokinesis process, during the, the cell division process. DNTP is another molecule that's involved, um, you know, in that cycle, and it's, and it's doing sensible things throughout the lifetime of the cell. They're also um, able to make predictions about the relationship between uh, molecules that are inside the cell um, and the different phases. So they're able to um, show that there are, um, you know, correlations between the amount of um, DNA molecule um, during the time scale of replication initiation duration. So as uh, replication initiation uh, progresses, there's less and less of, uh, less and less concentration of DNA A molecules. Uh, DNT DNTP is dropping during the process of replication. And um, during the process of replication initiation, you're also seeing, um, you're also seeing the replication duration um, you're seeing a, a correlation um, between the time uh, scale of replication duration and replication initiation duration. So this is, this is nice. This is, um, you know, just a fraction of the, some of the predictions that you'd be able to see in this since um, you actually have 16, um, these 16 categories of states of things that you can look at. Um, but this is just kind of gives you a sense of, of some of the things that they're able to measure and some of the predictions that, are able, that you're able to make when um, you're tracking um, all the things within this molecule that you're able, that you're able you know, all the things inside this uh, simulation that you're able to track. So in terms of validation, um, there were three major things that were reported in the paper. Um, essentiality of each gene uh, that was reported by a previous paper. Um, and that's um, basically saying what they were able to do in this model is do in silico gene uh, deletions. So, that, so they're able to take the, the genome, they're able to pull out a gene, um, and see the consequences of it in running the 28 cellular processes. And then they're able to compare how essential that gene is to um, the, the growth rate and uh, the cell cycle um, as compared to measurements that had been made experimentally by this, um, this other paper, Glass et al. They're also able to um, measure the growth rate, so how fast growth is happening and how quickly the cell progresses through the cell cycle to cytokinesis um, of a specific um, single cell disruption strains. And then they're also able to compare um, what uh, the cell model predicts in terms of what's present in the cytosol. Um, the cytosol, of course, is um, the, the part of the cell where essentially all the, where, where molecules are sort of moving around. Um, it's, a, you know, the, the meat of the cell, if you will. Um, so they're able to basically look at uh, how, you know, what are the concentrations of molecules inside the cell 
um, and they're able to compare those uh, concentrations to what you'd find inside um, of E. coli. So one of the key um, experimental validation figures inside the paper here, um, of which there were many, um, is this one. So just to kind of walk you through this. Um, so they're basically, um, the, the axes here are along, um, along the X is the, um, the, the, the growth rate that was predicted. Um, and along the Y axis is the growth rate that was, um, that was described in a paper. And they're basically comparing, um, so if, if you follow along the, um, the, the X equals Y line, what they're saying is that, that anything that falls directly along this line means that the model is perfectly predicting uh, what the experimental growth rate is. And uh, anything that's off that line um, means that you're either predicting a uh, faster or a slower growth rate. Um, they uh, have a bar in the middle here where they're sort of saying um, a number of standard deviations um, inside which they would consider um, the model to have been making a good prediction. And if it falls outside, they're sort of saying that it, it's not as good of a prediction. And then they've also categorized this into, um, as comparing to this particular uh, paper, um, predictions that are uh, true for non-essential deletions, uh, false for essential deletions, and, and the wild type. So the, the wild type here, um, so they're basically getting uh, something that's falling along the center here for the wild type. Since they use the wild type for their training data, that, that's you know, to be expected that um, that should fall along the center um, because they trained on it. So, so that's good that that, um, that, that matches up. Um, where it gets more interesting is where they've gone in and um, made predictions about the kind of growth rates that they're going to see for these different deletions. So these other green points that are scattered around here with these letter codes, um, each of these letter codes is a stand-in for an experiment that they've done where they've taken the model, they've pulled out a gene um, in simulation, and then they've compared that to somebody actually going into the cell and, and pulling uh, in, into the real mycoplasma genitalium and pulling out that gene and growing it and seeing how fast it grows um, that was published in, in, in Glass et al. So this point here is, is showing, is comparing the growth rate that um, came from the experiment versus the growth rate that was predicted. And so having a look at this as well, the, the bars that you're seeing here, uh, the reason that this is sort of an X is that it's showing you the, uh, the standard deviations uh, for those different uh, experiments, both the ones that were um, you know, predicted and, and those that were found experimentally. So you're both able to see the sort of the error bars and, uh, and, and, and then the, the mean of, of where that fell. So this is quite nice, actually. You're seeing that there's um, quite a lot of the, um, the, the gene um, deletions uh, experiments here that were green that are falling inside of their bar uh, that uh, represents a, a good fit. And then they found some that fell outside. And um, I don't have time to go into, into all the details, but this was actually interesting as well. So one of the important things, the whole point, really, I think, of, of making these sort of cell, um, these cell simulations is not just to validate that uh, you can reproduce exactly what biology uh, tells you, but it's also interesting to see where, uh, in some cases, your model might break down. And so in the cases of this uh, THYA and the DEO, D, they actually um, found the, that the model was making different, um, were, were predicting different growth rates than what they um, were discovering in, in, the, um, in the actual experiments. And um, you know, maybe in the question period, we can go a little bit into more detail about, what, about why these um, findings were, were interesting. But what they're actually just briefly able to do um, with this is they're able to examine these places where the model um, where the model doesn't do originally um, what it said it was going to do, and they went back to the biology and asked some questions about why that might be. They uncovered uh, a little bit more about some of the mechanisms about what they uh, what might be behind it. And my understanding, um, and we can go to the authors to to validate this, but um, they're actually able to bring the model back into alignment with um, what the predictions are based on um, you know based on making some changes that um, you know were were. Um, were inspired by uh, a deeper analysis of these particular places where um, the model breaks down. So um, that's what's exciting, I think, about computational you know, cell biology and this idea where we're actually able to run, um, ask questions of the model that uh, give us a new insight, a new understanding as to what the actual biology might be doing. I think that's you know, the, an important theme here for us to take away um, 
into the, into the future about thinking about how we might be asking other exciting questions down the road um, that lead to other investigations. Um, just moving back here to the, you know, to the presentation, um, they also um, made a, um, you know, predictions of essentiality or non-essentiality. So they have, they have a criteria for um, how removing a lot more genes are going to, um, how they relate to whether the cell is going to be able to be essential or not, which, which essentially means whether the cell is going to die um, if that uh, gene is missing. Um, and so they have some criteria of, you know, if, if uh, the model grows way too slow compared to, um, you know, there's a certain cutoff of if it grows too slowly, that's considered to basically be a non-viable cell. Um, and they have a few other criteria um, that are, you know, uh, that are basically tracking if the cell is too messed up to basically divide. Um, that's considered to be a non-essential. And so they've basically gone in and, and run experiments on um, many of, their, uh, of the genes by pulling them out. And they're comparing this again to published uh, results. And what they're getting is, is an 80% rate where uh, the model correctly predicts that pulling out a gene is either going to uh, lead to uh, the cell not being viable or the cell being viable. Um, so in this, in this kind of graph, um, that's actually very good, uh, very good predictive value. Um, right. And the last prediction that they make, which I didn't, pull the, I didn't pull the figure for, as I mentioned before, is one of actually measuring the cyto cytosolic concentrations, and they're comparing this to some other data, and they're also getting good fits. Okay. So now I've labored on for, uh, you know, about 45 minutes, a bit longer than I, than I wanted to, but, uh, and, I, and I know I only scratched the surface of, you know, this, 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 awesome, uh, this awesome paper. So, um, uh, so what I want to do is, is, you know, take the opportunity to um, have Jonathan... Um, and uh, and his co-author and I'm and I'm sorry I don't want to I don't want to put your name but is it uh, Jayodita? Jayodita. Um, Jayodita. Okay. Um, so uh, I want you guys to to be able to get a chance to introduce yourselves because um, you know you, you guys are are shared co-authors uh, you know behind this work. Um, I got a chance to chat with Jonathan earlier this week um, you know and and, and dig in a little bit more. Um, so I do have some some ready-made questions but I, I didn't get a chance to meet your co-author. Um, but I do also want to open it up to, to this panel here, who I'm, I, I know have some prepared questions, um, where we can go into some more details on that. So um, let, me, um, let me stop and, and just, um, so if the two co-authors just want to introduce yourselves and just, just make any additional comments, or um, if I really screwed anything up, or you know, if there's anything you wanted to add to uh, you know what I said or highlight something, please, please go for it. So Jonathan, let me, let me turn it over to you. Um, sure. Uh, thanks, Stephen, for organizing the Journal Club. Uh, Stephen and I actually met at a conference a couple months ago, and um, and I had found out uh, about Open Worm, so I was excited to come to the Journal Club and hear about your efforts to try to model C. elegans. Um, so I'm just a, a graduate student at Stanford in um, biophysics, and I joined Marcus's lab about five years ago um, to to build uh, detailed models of, of cells and particularly bacteria. And I'll let Jadita introduce herself. Yeah, hi, my name is Diodita. I'm also a graduate student. Um, I, I'm going to be going into my sixth year in bioengineering. Um, and thanks, Stephen, for the great introduction. It's kind of a great sanity to tech to see that other people are kind of understanding your work and interested in your work. So thanks for organizing this. Stephen's now joined us twice. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for us about the work? I have a question if we're ready for questions. Yes, All right. Um, so one of the ones that I was curious about, and it might be in, I, I tried to read the, all the supplements, but I didn't get it like, through them all. But um, are you using any of the standards that are being um, <coughs> developed already in um, with like the SBGN notations or cell ML, are you are you using those things? That, and will your work propagate into other people's work because of that? So. We haven't used um, SBML or cell ML or, or any of the other main standards, uh, primarily because. And Steve and I were talking about this the other day, uh, primarily because those standards don't they're not able to express everything that we needed to express. Um, so we could certainly export parts of the model, 
Um, but we wouldn't be able to include all of the equations in SVML because it, it just doesn't uh, have a representation for that. So what we've done instead is just to provide all the data in the Excel sheets, and then we also have a database that you can go and query uh, the data at. You can also download the data in SQL if that's what you prefer. Great, uh, thanks. Yeah, that was that, that, that was what I suspected actually that it might not be like those models might not be suitable for the the place you're going at this point. So. Yeah, I think SBML and CellML are the right way that the field needs to go because they definitely help people share models. But at this point, if you do something which is outside of the SBML standard, then uh, for the moment you just can't ex express your model in SBML or CellML or BioPacks or anything like that. Uh, are, there, are there other questions? You guys can just can just jump in with questions. Um, while you guys are thinking, I did want to ask one. So I know that um, we had talked a little bit about the um, the the the, the, parallel is the parallelization of the model as a topic that uh, I think uh, got a lot of a lot of play, um, certainly in social media and in, in some of the some of the news articles. Um, could you just explain a little bit about how the parallelization worked for this model and and, and how you guys used it? Sure. I think that that was uh, actually quite exaggerated in the news. So we actually uh, didn't build a parallel implementation of any of the simulations. What we did instead was, because the simulation is random, we ran simulations of different insulico cells in parallel on a cluster that we built. Um, and, and our cluster had 128 cores, so we were able to simulate up to 128 cells at once. And that being said, future work in our lab is looking into making more parallelized code and making it more efficient. And we would love help from the community too about suggestions and how to make the code more efficient and faster running. So each each cell in itself is not parallelized at the moment. You you, you parallelize the multiple mm -hmm. cells, but each of them is like yes. sequentially processed. Yes. Right? Yeah, that, that's correct. Okay. We always knew that we were going to need to simulate a population of cells, so we just never focused on building a parallel implementation of one cell. Uh, but that said, it, it would be very helpful for uh, for model development if you could simulate any one uh, or run any one simulation more quickly. Yeah, I, I have a question. If if I can jump in. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about the basically multi-scaled nature of the problem at hand. So I, I just briefly introduce myself. I'm, I'm, my name is Giovanni Idili. I I work on the Open Worm project, coordinated by Stephen and uh, with some lab as well as on the on the project as well who's present now. And I have a software engineering back background, so I might I, my question might like. Uh, underline my lack of biology training, so I, I I'll be aware of that. But my my, my question is more about the uh, multi-scale nature of the problem itself. So, what's fascinating for me about uh, this this paper this paper and your work in general is that you're doing 28 different algorithms, and uh, in the worm at the moment we're only doing two, which is like the electrophysiology. Uh, can actually and all that stuff uh, and the physics, so we're we're facing a similar problem, but uh, like we're we're struggling with two and uh, two years that you guys have been working with twenty eight. It's kind of mind blowing. So it's it's awesome. Uh, it was great to read the, all the details. The one thing that I was wondering is uh, I seem to understand from the paper that you have a master clock that operates around uh, one second. Uh, how did you determine that? Uh, I, I read that basically there is an assumption that uh, up basically below one second the different algorithms, different processes are independent from each other. What, what are some of the time scales of those processes and uh, how did you determine that one second to do the integration between the different uh, uh, algorithms was okay? Did you did you try to raise it as as much as you could, or did you? Uh, what was the process behind behind that? 
Um, so we definitely wanted to have a time scale that was long enough such that we didn't have to worry about diffusion time scales. Um, and you could kind of assume that molecules in the cell would find each other within our time step. And so that was one of the reasons that we went kind of long. Also, the way we represent metabolism requires us to reach a quasi-steady state um, between each time step. Um, but other than that, it was kind of just the first thing we tried. And for this first version of the model, we did not play too much with the time step. We've talked about having a system in which that is kind of a parameter that you can play with, making the time step longer, shorter. Um, but of course, that functionality does not exist yet. Um, and all the processes are independent um, within the time step, but that doesn't mean that within those processes, reactions cannot happen faster than at one second. So say if you're looking at transcription, you could have multiple reactions occur within transcription within that one second. So each of the processes do have kind of a smaller time step independently. They just talk to each other every one second. Um, we also are fortunate I guess that this overall cell cycle is so long, about um, nine hours, where we can actually, like, to see kind of larger phenotypes, it doesn't matter that we take this big of a time step because we're simulating for so long. Jonathan, do you have anything to add to that? Um, no, I mean, I think that was a, a great description of the, the issue. We really just didn't, unfortunately, we, we uh, we had to sort of pick the problems that we wanted to focus on, and the time step was one that we chose to just uh, largely ignore and, and just pick a particular time step that sounded reasonable and, and then um, work with that. I think there's a lot of um, more work that needs to be done to, uh, to make it possible for you to explore different time steps. The reason I, I, I'm asking is that we're going through a similar process in terms of integration between the Hodgkin actually model and the uh, physical uh, in, in actually in the worm itself. So we're trying to figure out what's the interval, what's the minimum uh, interval that we can use for integration between the different models. So that's why I'm interested in. Uh, for us, it's uh, so it's a very similar problem. It's interesting to see that we are not completely off track. We're kind of thinking something along the same lines. So this is a validation for what we are thinking at the moment. So yeah, thanks for the answer. Yeah, I think you could consider a, a more complicated clock where all the processes or your sub models don't synchronize on the same time scale. But that'll make the model more complicated. Uh, I have seen there's one flux balance analysis paper where people have done something like that, where they have different reactions and they all update on different time scales. But then you have a much more complicated clock. Uh, which yeah. is going to make your whole simulation more complicated. So yeah, we, we only have two processes uh, at the moment. So yeah, I think the master clock is the way to go. It's just we're struggling to understand how how low does it need to be, and it's difficult to know until you try. So at the moment we're kind of using this lower time step as the master clock. So the physics are a bit slower than the neuronal. Uh, so there's a number of cycles of the neuronal simulation and then every step of the physical simulation there's going to be an integration. So we're basically using this this lower uh, step as the master clock. And I was kind of thinking, kind of wondering yeah, if that, that was like the right choice. Yeah. So yeah, I was curious about that. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so one of the things that uh, Jonathan, you and I talked about here a little bit earlier this this uh, week, which I, I wanted to highlight, um, was um, you know, when you were first getting into uh, this area and you were thinking about um, where the field was, you sort of looked at different um, different spots where biology and, and computer science kind of intersect, and you ended up settling here. Um, could you tell us a little bit? Could, could, could you tell everybody um, a little bit about your thought process there and also um, you know, what you might recommend, um, and, and this is for both of you, what you guys might recommend for somebody who maybe has a, you know, has a computer science background but they're looking to kind of get more into this and they are a little, um, they might be a little uh, hesitant because they don't have as much of a biology background or, or vice versa. 
Um, sure. I think there's um, there's a lot of areas in biology where uh, computational scientists could potentially get involved. I had initially gotten interested in college in computational neuroscience, uh, which is a somewhat similar field to systems biology, um, but more abstract and less focused on data. And in, in, in college, then I had gotten some more exposure to systems biology and and I've been interested in, in combining computation with with um, molecular biology and found systems biology to be very interesting. Um, so I think there's a lot of certainly a lot of opportunity in systems biology uh, for computational scientists to, to get involved, uh, bioinformatics, medical informatics, computational neuroscience is a smaller field. Um, but there's opportunities there as well. And then there's opportunities in, uh, in other areas too, like uh, genomics, uh, evolutionary biology, ecology. There's really computation spread throughout biology at this point. Um, so my background is actually in biology. and. Um, I've kind of just gotten into the computational world to, through taking a few CS and bioinformatics and computational biology classes. Um, and I really have enjoyed it and would recommend it to anyone. Um, you also asked about the opposite direction, starting from CS and moving into biology. And in some regards, I might think that's the easier path to take. Um, for example, when we were trying to build all of the modules that went into this, um, even though I did have a background in biology, we did have to read all these papers and really like learn all the details that go into the individual processes. And so it's not like just because I had a background in biology, it saved me all that time of having to actually go in and still learn all the biology. And so I think it's definitely possible for anyone with a CS background to, I mean, after you learn the vocabulary, it would be really the exact same thing of having to just go into the literature and learning about what you're trying to model. So I have a, I have a fairly somewhat general question that, that I think ties in a little bit. Um, so one of the, I mean, kind of going to the computational neuroscience thing. Um, Why don't you introduce yourself real quick, Justin? What's that? Why don't you introduce yourself real quick? Uh, I'm. Can you introduce? Yeah. Yourself oh, introduce myself. Gotcha. I got it. Um, I'm Justin Kiggins. I am a uh, comp neuro, computational neuroscience student at uh, at UCSD, um, and uh, so yeah, so that's who I am. Um, so I so one of my 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 motivation is that you know a lot of a lot of what we a lot of the foundational work and a lot of the assumptions in computational neuroscience goes back to the Hodgkin Huxley models that Giovanni was mentioning. Uh, which is kind of a, a very good example of taking uh, taking research that's been done on one particular model system, um, you know, the squid giant axon, and then we've we've uh, then sort of taken that that data and and extrapolated that and and make a lot of assumptions about about the way human neurons work because of that. And so what my my specific question is is um, you know through this entire model you guys. You know, ha had to pull from from E. coli and and from sort of other organisms and other data sources to inform this model wh where the where the data wasn't there for you. And I just, in a very general sense, what do you guys see as being the advantages and the disadvantages and the potential shortcomings of of taking such an approach? Because it seems like it's going to be a major hurdle for um, for big projects like the like the you know uh, th these projects like you know, model the human brain um, where we obviously don't have access to the, to, to the, all of the underlying data that we need in order to model the human brain, for example. Um, so, so you guys took a, had a particular set of solutions to that with, um, with, with this approach. And so I'm, I'm curious, how did you come to those, those solutions and what do you see as being the limitations? Do you want to take this or should I? Um, you can if you want. Or okay. um, so first, just kind of talking about what approaches we took when there wasn't existing data or there was holes in the data. Um, so I guess the first thing was 
there was actually very little that was measured in mycoplasma genitalium. So we did have to look to other organisms to see whether we could get the data that we needed. Um, and so we'd try to find either the closest organism or um, eventually resorting to Bacillus or E. coli for data. Um, but then still, of course, there were places where there were just no data at all. And that was places where we had to kind of fit the parameters that were missing um, according to kind of our training data set and trying to make sure that the phenotypes that we were looking for, like the cell should double and divide in time, kind of worked based on the parameters that we stuck in there. Um, moving into more complicated systems where even less might be known and there might be more unknowns, um, you're absolutely right that this would become a much bigger problem. And I think moving forward then, you have to almost maybe sacrifice the comprehensiveness of the model and really think about what exactly do we have to include to learn or like the answers to the questions that we're asking. And maybe you wouldn't include every single gene and every single molecule in the system, but maybe you could include enough to actually learn something meaningful from your model given the data that is available. Um, Jonathan? Do you have anything to add on that? Um, sure. I, mean, I think one way that we handled this problem was that often if there wasn't enough data, not only would we potentially try to fit the model, but we might actually choose the submodel to be simple so that we could avoid the whole the problem of needing to fit the data altogether. Uh, and that led us to more qualitative models. And, and that sort of gets into Data's point about maybe leaving out certain detail in order to build a model. Uh, I think one, one of the main challenges of this approach of taking data from uh, multiple organisms is then you may end up with data that conflicts with each other. So you may end up picking data from two organisms, and because those two organisms are different, then they sort of introduce a conflict in the data. And then what you need to do is somehow come up with a way of resolving these conflicts in the data and coming up with a consistent set of parameters which um, sort of fit all the data points uh, or at least approximately fit all the data points. Uh, so in the, in the future, I think going forward, you ideally like to avoid this by having a, a much more consistent set of data initially. So that the, all the data comes from one organism, one set of experimental conditions, um, some set of standard agreed upon methods by all the labs that are creating the data. But right now, we just didn't have that, and, and certainly not for the organism we picked, which is quite difficult to work with experimentally, as JD didn't knows quite well. Uh, so in, in the future, it, there's a couple other students in the lab who are starting to think about how to model E. coli, and this would alleviate some of the problems. There's a lot more data available, and it's a lot easier to generate the data. So it will be a lot more feasible to create a, a data set, which is from a consistent set of uh, experimental conditions and techniques. Yeah, I think that's a really good point right at the end. That it's not only the organism, but it's also the conditions at which the um, measurements were made. Um, if you have different temperatures, different media, then the data might still not be consistent with each other. I have a question that's kind of related to the model choices. So there were 28, I'm oh, sorry, I didn't introduce myself the first time. I'm Mary Mangan from Open Helix. I come from a uh, cell biology background but I have a um, computational uh, biology foreground now, um, and I provide training on a lot of software tools. Um, so my question is about these 28 modules. What percent of the whole cell do you think that is? I, I, I don't, I, is it one? Is it 10? Is it 50%? I don't, I'm not asking for a specific number, you know, but if you had some kind of sense of how many modules it will take to do the whole thing. Uh, so we've looked at this in a couple different ways. Uh, one way we've looked at it is in terms of the number of genes that we've, uh, the number of um, genes whose function we've included, and that's about 75%. Um, then another way that we've looked at it, which is a bit orthogonal to the genes, is in terms of the, the amount of the energy that cells require to grow and divide that we can account for. Uh, that de depends on knowing how much total energy cells actually need, which is also subject to some debate. But uh, by that metric, we account for something like 45%. Um, but that metric, I think, is 
is definitely a less reliable metric because it depends on a, this experimental measurement, which was done in another organism. Uh, and then in terms of accuracy, the, the primary metric that we've been using is the percent of gene single gene deletion phenotypes that we're able to correctly predict, which is about 80% of the 75% of genes that we've modeled. Did you, did you have anything to no, that's add? Yeah, that about covers it. Yeah, those are the pr primary metrics that we've been using. I guess the last thing to add is just when we're kind of do designating those 28 functions, um, at least we hope that the community agrees that we've kind of covered at least the major um, cellular functions that comes, come to mind when you're thinking about how a cell grows and divides. Can, can you think of any cell function that you, you know, left out on purpose um, because it would be sort of small or um, was it pretty much just about everything that you guys could, could think of? Um, I think one big thing that is going to help also the energy problem is that we haven't included the membrane potential in the model. And then I think another really big thing is just spatial considerations in the cell. So we don't have like a 3D grid that will tell you where every molecule in the cell is. Right, you guys broke it down into sort of six compartments, um, right, and grouped those differently. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of the, the way that you've done space, which yeah. is still a heck of a lot better than a single compartment. Um, but I think a reasonable compromise from you know, doing a full grid. Um, um, okay. Um, so yeah, about the membrane though. Um, so so does does this guy have a membrane or not? And if it does, what what kind of thing does it, does it have? What kind of potential does it? What is it? I mean, does it just it's just cytoplasm and the cytoplasm just ends, or, or how does that work? No, I mean obviously it has a membrane. Uh, it just doesn't have a cell wall like uh, some other kinds of bacteria. Uh, it actually has a membrane which is somewhat more human-like compared to other bacteria, uh, which potentially relates to its its natural host, which is a human urogenital tract. Um, so it certainly has a, 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 back, uh, a cell membrane. There's not much known about its elective physiology, and that's one reason why we haven't modeled it. Another reason, and sort of getting back to Giovanni's question about timescales, is that the electrophysiological time scales are quite fast, and that um, poses some difficulty for us. So by uh, not worrying about the membrane, then we also get to ignore those faster time scales. Um, and I think another big reason is that our um, the primary place that we are handling energy is in our metabolic model, and um, and we really just didn't focus on how that metabolic model would interact with the membrane potential. But I think it's in, that's certainly an interesting place for us to keep looking into in the future. Um, I think uh, so. Another question, and um, don't know how many are left here in the in, in the audience, uh, but it just just one that I, I do want to get out. I think one of the things that was most surprising. About uh, about the way that the paper came out is that it was published in Cell, which is not a journal that's known for publishing computational models, um, and, and I think that also adds a lot of you know credibility and legitimacy that um, you know Cell is perceived as this very sort of hardcore you know, biology thing, and, and this tension that I talked about a little bit before, where you know hard, really hardcore biologists can sometimes be skeptical of models. Um, so anyway, I think it just it, for for the computational community that might be more used to seeing a paper like this in, in a journal which is more specific to computational uh, biology, um, you know, I, I think it just, it just adds a lot of credibility, has a lot more impact. So could you say a little bit about, um, you know, what kind of feedback you got from reviewers and what that process was like? Do you want to take this or should I? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, so, I mean, we did talk about a number of journals and, um, and it ended up being Cell. Uh, one good thing about Cell was that because this is such a complicated project, it really helped us that we could write a slightly longer paper um, to explain it. Um, but it really, to us, was both a computational and a biology project. I mean, the motivation going into it really was to better understand the biology behind how a cell grows and functions. And to that point, I think it fits quite well in Cell 
where we're really trying to explain how a cell works. Um, we did get, you know, um, mixed reviews. Some were really, really positive, very excited that we were doing this project, and some suggested that we make changes to our paper, um, like I imagine every submission would be. Um, and I guess we're just really excited that they accepted it and think what we did was worthwhile to share with their community. Yeah, Cell treated us very well. Um, I, I can also point out that Cell now has a theory designation, so it seems that Cell is trying to get more into the space of publishing computational science papers and they have this new theory section. There aren't a lot of papers that are published in it, maybe only one every, uh, every issue or two. Um, but, but I think it's a good sign for computational science that they're moving in that direction. Um, other, other questions from here in the Hangouts? I have, have another one. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. It's a bit of an unorthodox question, uh, but since this is an informal Hangout, might as well ask it. It's more of a <laughs> popular oriented. Uh, so basically, you're the first project uh, to close the loop in a sense, to kind of simulate the entire system from the beginning to end and, okay, there's a metabolism self reproduces. So would you consider your, your spiritual cell to be alive? And if not, what's missing? I'll let JD to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can answer me after the hangout if you don't want to. <laughs> I mean, it's very much a virtual cell, right? So it would be the same thing as, I would say, like, sim people on a computer game, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's literally just a way to either explain a culture or a lifestyle or, in this case, a cell. Um, it's, I mean, it's made out of code. It's not living, but we hope that it explains life a little bit better and helps scientists get closer to kind of understanding what does happen in a real cell. Perfect. That's the official answer, then. Yeah. <laughs> um, there is a question from uh, from the internet. Uh, it was just posted. Um, so it's, by, it's from uh, Dan Knudsen, um, also a great student at UCSD. Uh, he asks uh, the following. In classical physics, um, we have things like Newton's equations of motion and chemistry of the periodic table and biology. The kinds of general first principle rules that we have seem to be really subject to the scale of interpretation, the model system, and the question of interest. Uh, he's Oh, gone. <laughs> okay, we lost Stephen again. I'll I'll finish off the question since he's I back. see him right here. He's back. Everybody, oh, he's back. Okay, all right, carry on, Stephen. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> Woo, let's see. This is this is rough. All right, he says in, in models like yours, a format for introducing something like first principles to biology. Each of your 28 sub-modules could be modified and formalized, and the field could use these as building blocks of building up biological proofs from first principles. He asks, am I crazy? Any comments on this? Um, I mean, I think that that's certainly the, the right way to go, that we like to sort of work up to a, a theory of cell biology. Uh, I don't think we're, we're quite at the level of uh, Newton's uh, equations of motion, for example, but we do some theories. We have cell theory that cells come from other cells, and we certainly use that. Uh, we didn't create it, uh, but we definitely use it in the model. We have the central dogma that uh, RNA and protein come from genes. We have things like um, mass action kinetics. Uh, so we have a, a, a kind of a, a assembly of theories that we're piecing together to uh, build this sort of unified theory of the cell, if you will. Um, but I, I don't think that any of the, the, the individual submodels are, maybe to put it this way, I, I think that there's certain amount of debate in any of the individual submodels that you could pick any one and, and criticize it, so I wouldn't quite elevate any of them to the level of theory. That being said, it is an interesting idea that these could be kind of building blocks for the field, 
And it would be interesting if, you know, the individual groups that are working on any of these individual 28 areas could kind of help build out the modules even more, um, con like make our understanding of each of the modules more concrete, and then maybe as a community we could come up with, you know, a much better set of these 28 modules. Yeah, maybe we need to do something like open Mycoplasma and, and open source the project and get people to contribute on the inter internet similar to open worm and, and just build a much more much larger community of researchers that way We're happy to help in any way we can <laughs> uh, you, you, even our website is open source so if you want to reuse our website source code and uh, you know and copy it that's, uh, that's all you're doing. I think C elegans has a bigger community so it might be a better choice. You can start uh, another project called Open Cell. <laughs> Maybe that's what we should do. Um, so that, that does actually raise raise an interesting point, though. I mean, so given where things are now, if would, would do you see um, folks in the future taking the model and sort of rerunning it and you know updating it and then publishing a paper that um, like uh, adds uh, to the algorithms or flushes the algorithms out, and and then um, you know putting a copy of their code up somewhere. Or um, have you guys have you guys gotten that far in terms of thinking about um, making this uh, you know a, a, a node for collaboration? Um, the work the work that you've done beyond just a download that you've made available. Um, I think we absolutely hope that. Um, this does become that sort of project. Um, Jonathan just told me the other day that we've already had hundreds of downloads of our code, so we hope that people are looking at it and using it, and you know, hopefully interesting things come out. Yeah, we haven't done anything specifically to try and organize a community around it, but we have gotten a few suggestions to post it on GitHub to make it easier for pe people to, to uh, contribute back to the code base. Um, and SimTK actually has a stub version repository already, so maybe we, we could use that, although Git is um, maybe better for distributed development like this. I think that would be fascinating. It, uh, it's hard to say how many people are really interested in contributing, how much code will actually get contributed back to the code base. I guess we can only try and, and just see what happens, see how much interest there, there might actually be. Is there is there are you aware of a particular uh, open source license uh, that this is that this is published under? Um, I didn't I didn't check that part. Just in terms of if folks oh, uh, write it or or whatever it is or I have to check with Stanford first or I mean whatever it is at the moment. Just good to know. To be honest, I didn't really pay a lot of attention to licensing. I should probably do that. Maybe it's taken care of by <laughs> by think DK where you published it. They, they probably are worried about that stuff too. Uh, yeah, I think that there was a licensing option on the site when when you post the code. Uh, I think it's under the MIT license. Okay. But uh, I have to check what I chose. So since we're uh, uh, kind of getting getting more towards the end, um, uh, what I'd, I'd like to do is sort of uh, just. To, uh, Closing is to think a little bit towards the future. Um, the two of you are graduate students, uh, you know, I think uh, setting off onto bright careers. And I'm just curious, uh, you know, Jonathan, you and I talked a little bit about this, but I think other folks would be curious as well for, for Jodita. Um, where, what will you want to do next? And, um, you know, what kind of direction you think that your research will take? And how much of it do you think will directly be building on this? And how much of it do you think is going to be, you know, pioneering in, in some new related um, yeah, um, I mean, this was an incredible learning experience for me, and I really do hope that I can use a lot of what I learned um, in this process moving forward. My goals are to probably move to a more apply, um, therapeutically applied project, um, but still be stay in the realm of computational modeling um, so that I can continue to kind of use what we learned here. Um, that's about it. I'm definitely looking around and seeing what exciting opportunities come my way. Um, 
Yeah, uh, actually, the, the question of uh, managing a large open source project also relates to the fact that both of us are graduate students and that it's, uh, there's really n no one to really oversee the project uh, in terms of like managing a large open source project going on, which is kind of a shame, and that's the way I think a lot of biology is organized, that people create these great projects, and then because they're created by graduate students or postdocs, they're somewhat temporary in their nature, and then um, it's hard to ensure that things live on, and PIs don't necessarily want to uh, take over that responsibility. Uh, but uh, in terms of my future plans, uh, I've gotten very interested in uh, personalized medicine, as Stephen and I were talking about the other day, and uh, in multicellularity. And so I've been thinking about doing a postdoc in um, multi-scale biology to learn more about multicellular organisms and how we can model larger things like maybe sea ligands or even humans in the future. Uh, throw it out one last time to the panel here. Are any closing questions? Anything that's a bit answered? Well, thanks, Stephen, so much for organizing the Hangout, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. My pleasure, yes. Thanks, everybody, um, and um, you know, stay tuned for uh, other exciting things. This, uh, this whole video uh, should be posted to YouTube um, in the next um, you know, hour or so, um, so hope you'll be able to watch it again. Um, again, um, you know, check out the original paper, um, have a look through the source code. Um, I think these guys would be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, and as well, um, have a look at uh, openworm.org um, as a, another interesting project that's going on in the same space. I think we have very short meetings. But thanks to both you guys, to uh, you know, uh, the authors to, to, who were able to join us here and really shed light on this, on this great paper. Um, thanks to the um, and the rest of your audience question answers and, and thanks to all of you who uh, stopped by to promote this. So. And thank you all for a great discussion and thank you, Stephen, for organizing. It's been fun. My pleasure. All right, everybody. Good stuff. Bye.